Joining me now on the show is Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, the Chief Scientist of the World Health Organization. Dr. Swaminathan, thank you for being on NDTV. I'd just like your perspective on the latest India numbers, because as we know now, India, according to the World Health Organization, is contributing the third highest number of cases globally as well. Yes. So what we're seeing is that this virus has been moving around the world, you know, starting from China, but then moving into, into parts of Europe, then the North America, South America, that whole continent. And in, in Asia, South Asia particularly, it's been there for a while, mm -hmm. but the growth has been quite slow. And uh, the fact is that as long as you have populations that are susceptible or vulnerable to this virus, who do not have immunity to this virus. And wherever you have other uh, conditions which promote transmission, like high density settings, like we see in our in our urban areas where people are living, mm -hmm. uh, you know, chock a block and where you cannot maintain physical distancing, there is going to be this risk of transmission mm -hmm. ongoing. What we've seen even in countries that thought that they had contained it or controlled it they have seen outbreaks happening either in, in, in small clusters or even spreading much more widely. And they're trying to identify why that occurred and where it, where uh, there's the highest risk of this happening. So I think for India, it's a question of really being prepared mm -hmm. in the medium to long term of how one is going to handle the COVID um, pandemic and, and the increasing rates of infection that are bound to occur with the maintenance of, on the one hand, economic situation has to be stabilized. Mm -hmm. Livelihoods need to get back. People need to start earning a living again. We have huge numbers of people who, you know, depend on a daily wage and also maintaining the other essential health services so that of we're course. not losing a grip on things like antenatal care, immunization, TB services, mental health, uh, and so on. So this is really, I think, a challenge for India and for countries around the world. They're all grappling with, so, with so the same. So Dr. Swaminathan, what phase would you, would you describe India uh, as now being in? Because in fact, a city, of course, which you know well, uh, Chennai, Mumbai, Delhi, all facing very similar problems in the kind of rise of cases that we're seeing. Uh, different cities, different states adopting different models uh, regarding containment, uh, screening, testing. What do you think is the way that India perhaps needs to go or looking specifically at these city models? Because so far, urban India seems to be facing the real issue rather than rural India so far. Exactly. And, and again, the reasons for that are clear. I mean, these, uh, the, the importation of the virus occurred in the urban areas where there's a lot of air travel and lots of people coming and going. And also because of the density that the spread is much easier in urban areas and also the facilities for testing have also been scaled up much more rapidly. So I think a couple of things looking ahead. One is that the testing strategies, I think, need to be um, thought of and developed for the country as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's good to have certain clear strategies as well as certain criteria and parameters for evaluating. So and that I think should be at a national level, for example, looking at tests per million that are done, looking at uh, the test positivity rate and how te states are either increasing or decreasing the number of tests performed according to the test positivity rate. So it's not the total numbers one needs to be concerned so much about, mm -hmm. but really looking at the baseline population as a, as a denominator. Secondly, as you pointed out, I think urban and rural is very different. And the kind of strategies you need in Delhi, Chennai, Mumbai are going to be different from what you might need in a smaller town or, or in rural, though that's very important. So, for example, in a place where it's a remote area, you might want to use the gene expert, you know, the cartridge base, which can test one or two at a time, mm -hmm. but which gives you a quick result. You might want to use, um, if we get a good antigen-based uh, rapid test, which is at the moment, we don't really have a very highly accurate antigen test, but that would be excellent also for using in mm -hmm. clinics. And in uh, these high density urban areas, one might think of using uh, high throughput methods. You know, you have these big automated machines now that right. can run thousands of samples a day. Mm -hmm. And so if you to scale it up, and I think that's what Mumbai actually did in Dharavi is they actually ran these fever clinics 
they went uh, house to house to collect people mm-hmm. and building this confidence in the system the fact that if they get tested and they are found positive that they will be taken care of that they will be kept in a nice you know covid uh, facility that there will be medical attention okay. and that there's some kind of a also a social safety net especially for those who are coming from you know under the poverty line so that the families are also looked after and fed for those 14 days when they are in quarantine in fact uh, just uh, one aspect on that because uh, this of course a huge challenge for any country's healthcare system and also in india our healthcare systems also are inadequately distributed in the sense that uh, tamil nadu of course has a robust functioning state government healthcare system so does kerala in uttar pradesh and bihar it's very different in delhi uh, focus a lot more on private healthcare of course besides aims and lnjp but when you are looking at what the situation is now in terms of we've seen uh, patients desperate looking for plasma donors looking for hospital beds uh, people dying in ambulances and the fact that even though our mortality rate is much lower than other countries it is now creeping up as we see with the latest figures as well is that uh, is that something that is you uh, want india to watch out for or you would like india to be more alert about the mortality rate and the availability of hospital facilities for critical patients certainly i mean i think that is one of the biggest challenges and the situation that one wants to avoid is that hospitals particularly icus they get overburdened and and there are no beds then for the sick patients so one way of keeping mortality down is to is to expand testing so that you're actually picking up people at an earlier stage of the infection and you're monitoring them in facilities so that you can detect the level if the levels of oxygen drop and you know they immediately provided oxygen having these different levels of care uh where there's oxygen available uh, but you need trained staff by the way at these centers mm-hmm. so i think this is the right time and in fact the lockdown was a time that was used to prepare for these additional uh, beds and additional um uh you know places where you can take care where you can triage and take care of people mm-hmm. who are either mentally sick or they as they get sicker and then the 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 issue with critical care really is that there are a limited number of critical care beds and it's not just a question of buying more ventilators it's a question of do we have the teams to mm-hmm. be able to manage these people because for a critical care you need a team you need respiratory therapists nurses doctors and others who are monitoring the patient and you know 24 hours a day mm-hmm. and so there there need to be effort put into training these people particularly in the smaller towns and perhaps in the district hospitals where this is going to be needed mm-hmm. so i think track of the keeping mortality down which so far india has successfully done is it should be one of the key goals going forward and the second one is of course trying to reduce transmission as much as possible do you uh, find also uh, dr swami nathan that uh, the who uh, the chief of course uh, dr tedros just said just a few days ago warned that this epidemic is or pandemic is not over at all talking about rising numbers in brazil russia uh, the us still in new states and india as well where do you see the peak happening in india we were talking about peaks uh, from may onwards but do you see any indication of a peak happening in india anytime soon and how worried are you about the global numbers and india's contribution to that So I think it's pretty difficult to to predict a peak because the peak also means that you're doing something to to bring that curve down and in cities where we saw that clearly going up and then coming down was because they reached the point where things were so bad their health systems were so overwhelmed that they had to shut everything down mm-hmm. and and prevent people from meeting each other and that's how they actually turned the corner and came came down so we might in fact different countries are seeing different things and the prediction is that there are going to be waves you know you may not get this kind of peak that we saw in some of uh, the cities and countries in europe for example they may they are expecting a second peak some countries are already experiencing mm-hmm. or a second wave later in the year but as far as india is concerned because again of the factors that we mentioned the large population that still susceptible to this virus and the fact that all the conditions promote mm-hmm. transmission mm-hmm. are are there in mm-hmm. our particularly in the cities that we might continue to see uh a transmission going on i think what we have to do is to make sure that the transmission is at a level even if it continues and it's sustained it's at a level where it can be managed that it's not interfering with life as we know it and it's not interfering with the way in which the health system is able to deliver care that is the the balance 
that one needs to uh, to to seek, and that is why I think we need a uh, focus on how are we going to sustain these levels of testing? Mm -hmm. How is contact tracing going to be done? I mean, I think people have been mobilized in the short term for doing contact tracing, but many countries are now hiring contact tracers and training them because they realize that these people are going to be needed for many months or even a year or two to come. And so you need a cadre of people. That's this actually... comes back to the importance of mm -hmm. uh, public health cadre. Very few states in India have uh, a directorate of public health Mm -hmm. you know, and a trained workforce. You need field epi epidemiologists. You need you need a, a team, basically, that does surveillance, that does response, and that, you know, picks up. So that's, ac that's actually a very interesting point you just made, that actually India went the reverse of the rest of the world, where they actually saw a huge number of cases and then locked down. India actually locked down early, perhaps delayed the onset, and then we're opening up at a time when cases are going up. So it's an interesting challenge we have ahead of us. But one thing, Doctor, I mean, since this... Uh, epidemic actually began from January, February, uh, when the world realized its seriousness. There have been so many different contradictory instructions, some would say, from the WHO as well. Wear masks, don't wear masks. Uh, should you be in an uh, air-conditioned environment in office or not? Is it airborne? Is it not? Will the hot weather actually make a difference or not? And almost everything has been turned on its head. What would you say to a person watching today who is now back at work, back in offices, having to lead a life, in a sense, outside when cases are rising every day? What would you say to our viewers watching you this evening? I think the first thing to point out is that because this is a new virus uh, and we've had to react you know, from day one with what we know about other coronaviruses and put out guidance based on how we think this virus could be spreading and how it behaves, and over the last few months, we've learned a lot. And as we've learned, we've refined our guidance, both WHO and other agencies and governments around the world have had to adapt their policies and their guidance based on the new uh, information that we're getting about mm -hmm. this uh, virus. Now, we know a few things, and I think that's important to keep in mind, especially as offices open, public transport opens, schools and colleges are opening in many countries. One is that this virus spreads mostly by droplet transmission. Which so the way to minimize that is of course to maintain mm -hmm. a distance. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're more than one meter away from the other person, most of the droplets actually fall down and don't actually reach. Mm -hmm. But wearing masks. So for a country like India, I think universal wearing and India was ahead, mm -hmm. by the way, of other agencies which came, including WHO. India actually came with a mask guidance well before, but I think we need to make that universal. It, it has to become like a part of your habit that when you're going out of the house, you have to wear a mask. And unless everybody wears a mask, it's not going to have the kind of effect. And the mask has to be properly worn to cover the nose and mouth, including in office settings where you cannot maintain physical distance. Disinfection of surfaces, maintaining the physical distance, being very observant you know, of when you cough and sneeze, of course, doing the hand washing, when ventilation is, is key, it's been seen that if you have a cross ventilation in the room, then the chances of even the droplets hanging around there for very long are, are minimized. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's public transport or whether it's uh, offices, I think going away from air conditioning to ha trying to have as much as possible ventilation and fans to keep the air circulating uh, would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And so every... Every, I think, organization or office or uh, transport system or shops or industries needs to think about what they're going to do to increase safety. You've seen these outbreaks happening in Germany, but in also in the U.S. and other countries, right. in factories that are working on meat packing and so on, where people are very close together. The temperature is kept very low in these environments, mm -hmm. and it appears that that is a good, and, and people are not wearing any uh, protection like masks and so on. And that's an environment. We've seen this happening in dormitories and so on. So we know now which are the conditions where this virus is likely to uh, to uh, have increased right. spread. And then we can address those by putting in place, you know, hand washing stations, for example, in slums. People have to queue up for hours to get water. You know, water is not easily available. So putting in place hand washing stations where there's soap and water available, make sure that all schools have it, all health facilities have it, mm -hmm. that slums mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. it. And there are a lot of, um, I've seen innovations coming in the water and sanitation field, particularly with the Swachh Bharat mission, there was a lot of focus on, on low that. cost of 
portable. So in, fact, uh, in fact, some of the solutions, as you point out, are the simplest possible. So it, it's something that everyone can do. This, as I said, these are challenging times ahead. But Dr. Swaminathan, thank you so much for joining us with your perspective uh, from Geneva. Thanks so much, Dr. Swaminathan. Thank you, Sunday.